The Romance of the Ranchos. Los Angeles, 1846. Revolt threatens small American garrison. San Francisco, 1846. Lone Rider covers 600 miles and ride for help. San Pedro, 1846. Battle of Dominguez Ranch, disastrous American defeat. The Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles presents The Romance of the Ranchos, a weekly dramatization of the colorful characters and events which furnish the background for our Southern California of today. Each week, our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, returns to tell us another true story of an exciting chapter in the history of the Southland. Starting on March 8th, Romance of the Ranchos will be brought to you at a new time, 8.30 to 9 o'clock each Sunday evening. Radio listening records indicate that for the great majority of Southern California families, this will be a more convenient day and hour. And Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles hopes that all of you present listeners will continue to be their guests every week. Remember, a new day, Sunday, and a new time, 8.30 p.m., and the starting date, Sunday, March 8th. Remember, too, to buy defense bonds and stamps as liberally and as frequently as you can. Make it a regular habit to invest in America and in your own family's financial future. And now here to tell us the story is our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham. Buenas noches. Senoras y senores, our story tonight deals with a dramatic period in the growth of California, the American conquest, and also with a particular incident in that period which, had circumstances been slightly different, might have been celebrated in song and story along with the ride of Paul Revere. It was the feat accomplished by John Brown, whom the Californians called Juan Flaco or Lean John. It's a story rich in the romance of the ranchos. Our story starts in the uneasy days just before the Californians learned that Mexico was at war with the United States. Colonel John C. Fremont had just organized an expedition to continue his explorations along the West Coast and, incidentally, to keep an eye on the province of California. For the Californians were dissatisfied with Mexican rule and the British were vying with the Americans for the purpose of winning the country peacefully. And so it was that as Colonel Fremont was recruiting his small force, he was approached by a tall, slim man. Yes, Colonel Fremont. I'm Juan Flacco. Lean John, the Californians call me. You have another name, no doubt. Oh, sure. Name's John Brown. An American? Well, now I think so. Born in Sweden, though. Hmm. You don't speak like a Swede. Been speaking English and Spanish most of my life. See, I ran away from home when I was 15. Shipped as a cabin boy aboard a Britisher. Been a soldier, mostly. For whom? Well, most anybody who had some fighting to do. Fought in South America under General Simon Bolivar. Fought in California under Alvarado and Michel Terrena. You know California pretty well? Better than any place. Well, I don't know, Lean John. We're going to do a powerful lot of riding. You don't look to me as though you'd last very long on a horse. Uh, don't let this here long stretch of me fool you, Colonel. I can ride pretty well. Maybe, but... Matter of fact, I've got a pretty good reputation as a horseman out there in California. Huh. Well, sir... We'll see if you can hold up in one of our saddles. You mean you'll take me? I'll give you a chance, Lean John. But I'll never know why. It'll be the first time I ever saw a bean pole on a horse. And so Lean John Brown joined the horsemen of Colonel Fremont's party as they crossed into California. There they found things fast coming to a head. As the party rode north toward Oregon, a messenger arrived with news. War may be expected any time, Colonel Fremont. And it's your duty to see that nothing goes wrong in California. But what about the American fleet, Gillespie? Commodore Sloat is anchored in Mexican waters. They'll move north at the first sign of trouble, but in the meantime, you're the only one really here on the scene to protect American interests. 
You can't go on north. I'm not sure where my duty lies. If I go back, the Californians may take offense. They might even find it a cause for war. But if you don't, who's to protect the Americans there? Already they're panicky about an attack from the Californians. Yes, maybe you're right, Gillespie. I'll give the order to turn around and head back into California. Fremont arrived in the Sacramento Valley just in time to find the American settlers expecting an attack momentarily and ready to take strong measures against the native Californians. Quickly, feeling spread and culminated in the Big Bear Flag Revolt, in which a handful of Americans proclaimed California a republic. Fremont resigned his army command so that he might join with them. But before they could see much action, news came that war with Mexico was on in earnest. Now, Fremont, with his men, hurried to meet Commodore Stockton's naval units. Both Fremont and the messenger Gillespie received commissions from Stockton, and they prepared to embark for the South to occupy San Diego and Los Angeles. King John. John Brown. Yes, Colonel Fremont. I'm sending you down on the other ship with Captain Gillespie. Why can't I string along with you, Colonel? Because you're familiar with the country, and Gillespie will need a man like you. All right, sir, if you say so. Good man. Uh, don't let that horse throw you. I'm not worried about any horses, but I don't think much of this here next stage of the trip. I'm worried about keeping my seat on this bucking bronco of a ship. Fremont landed at San Diego, occupied the city, and started north to meet Stockton, whose forces landed at San Pedro. With no organized opposition, they took Los Angeles, and to all appearances, the occupation of California was completed without the shedding of blood. Everything was so peaceful on the surface that Stockton and Fremont left for Monterey, leaving only Captain Gillespie's small force to occupy the hotbed of revolt that was Los Angeles. They'd not been gone long before the young captain's ill-considered restrictions had caused bad feelings. But, Senor Capitan, the 15th of September is a day of celebration here. It is a holiday for all citizens of Mexico. Yes, but you're no longer citizens of Mexico, Senor. And there'll be no celebrations here. I don't know what your celebrations are. They'd last a week. Everybody'd get drunk and anything might happen. Your feelings might run away with you. And I'm not taking the chance. There'll be no celebration. Very well, Senor. But I warn you, the people will not like this. They have not liked many things you have done. You had better watch your step. The 15th of September came and passed, and there was no celebration. But feeling was running high, and on the 22nd of September, 1846... Oh, who goes there? Captain Gillespie. Oh, is everything quiet? Yes, sir. There was a noisy crowd in the streets a little while ago. Sounded like a rowdy party. They've quieted down now. Hmm. It's almost too quiet. I don't like it. Well, I haven't seen anything suspicious, Captain. The street's deserted. It's so dark out there you can't tell whether it's deserted or not. Look. Hmm? Did you see something move over there in the shadows? Why, no, I don't think so. There. See? Across the street. Yeah. Something did move. Oh, it was probably a dog or something. Did you ever see a dog wearing a sombrero? Look. You can see the outline of it. It's a man. I can see him now. He's creeping across the street. And look, behind him, others. All right. Hold the alarm. Men, your places up quickly. Get your guns. All right, men, hold your fire. We've driven them off. Turn that was easy. Most of them were so drunk they didn't know what they were doing anyway. Yeah, there are only a handful, too. It doesn't matter how few of them there were. This is serious. Tomorrow we're going to take measures to see that this doesn't happen again. Captain Gillespie, it looked to me like just a wild spree. A few rowdies who got a little too much fire water. It doesn't matter what it looked like to you. This could start something serious. And tomorrow I'm going to make a few arrests just to see that it doesn't. All right, man, at ease. That's just the attitude, Captain. It's really going to get us into trouble. Juan Flacco was right. Captain Gillespie's belligerent attitude only inflamed the Californians. And what might have passed off as a minor incident became the spark that set off revolt. Gillespie arrested several prominent Californians to be held as hostages for good behavior. And within a day, Los Angeles was seething with unrest. And word came to the garrison. Why, it's a copy of the proclamation they issued against us. Oh, this is outrageous. It's revolution. Yes, Captain Gillespie, it is. Curious says almost 200 townspeople are taking up arms. 
Several of the parole Mexican officers joined them. Flores, Andre Pico, Jose Antonio Carrillo. They'll be sorry for this. Perhaps, but, Captain, those men are respected, responsible, sir. These men, they're leading their support and leadership to make a serious matter, perhaps more serious what than do you, you realize. Mean? I mean that we have a full-fledged war in our hands. There are several hundred disarmed soldiers in this area. They're all armed, too, and good fighters. They're all rising up, and our little company is no match for them. You don't think we can handle this? Well, frankly, no. Well, we're going to. You tend to your riding, Brown, and I'll give the order. Yes, sir, of course. But if you're determined to face them, may I make a suggestion? All right, what is it? Here in this government house, we're trapped. I suggest we move out of town and up onto the hill overlooking the town. There we might be able to hold out the cannon and our long-range rifles. Retreat? I wouldn't say so. I'd say it was smart strategy to move to a stronger position. Well, it might be a good idea at that. But we'd better do it now quickly, Captain, before they're mobilized and move into town. All right. I'll give the orders immediately. <laughs> Through the streets and up to the top of Fort Hill, the little band dragged the two cannon with as much ammunition and provisions as they could carry. They established their positions none too soon. Look at them. There are at least a hundred of them at the foot of the hill. And more over on the other side. Yes, Captain Gillespie. We're completely surrounded. They've established picket lines around us. They're going to starve us out, eh? Yes, and they will, too. Our provisions won't last very long. Not more than two weeks at most. Well, we'll just have to figure out something to break the siege. Well, how? We're perched up here where they can't do us any harm, but we can't do them any either. Samuel! Who is that? Who is that? We can't afford to waste a single shot. I want no one to fire unless they try and attack up the hill, which they probably won't. Now sit tight, everybody. We'll just have to wait them out. Gillespie, we have to do something. We're caught here in a trap. They're not going to give up. Yeah, it doesn't look much like it. They'll just hold us here until we're starving. Yes, if we could only get help. We have to get help. But how? Captain Wilson and his men have been captured at Chino Ranch and from Mountain Stockton or at Monterey, over 400 miles from here. And they're the nearest. I can make it in, let's see, three days. If they sail right away, we should have help here in a week. That would be time enough. Man, what are you talking about? You think you could get through their lines and ride to Monterey in three days? Why, you're crazy. I'm not crazy. I can do it. But even supposing you got through their lines, you'd have a ride of over 400 miles through hostile country, where every man is your enemy. I know, but I could take the back trails. Where would you get the horses? At that speed, you'd kill off your horses faster than you could find new ones. I'll find new ones, all right. And I'll get word to Stockton, I promise you. No, Brown, I can't let you do it. It's suicide. All right, it's my life, isn't it? Oh, but... And there's nothing else that'll save us. I'm going whether you give me permission or not. All right, John. You can go. Are you all ready? Yeah, as soon as I get this saddle tight in here. Oh, oh, easy there. Yeah, yeah, now. Now she's all ready. Best horse in the camp. She's going to have to be, I'm afraid. All right, Lean John. Here's the message for Stockton. I've written it on cigarette paper and fixed my seal to it so they'll know you can be trusted. It'll roll up into a little ball. Where do you want to put it? Well, let's see. Uh, how about in my hair, like this? Just tie it in my hair and no one will find it there. How's that? All right. Fix it good. Now, it's almost dark. You can start any time. Right. There's no use waiting. And I'll be off. Oh, wait. Aren't you taking a gun? No, just useless baggage. If I get to the point where I need one... I'd be a goner anyway. Well, you have to have some protection. I have my riata so I can rope myself a horse. That's enough. Well, goodbye, Captain Gillespie. I'll do my best. Goodbye, Lean John. And God bless you. Say, if I make this, maybe Colonel Fremont will have to eat his words about a bean pole on a horse. Hasta la vista! There are still some people who believe that a policy of title insurance is nothing more than a written opinion as to the ownership of a piece of land or real estate based on an examination of public records. Now, the issuance of a policy of title insurance does involve such a search of the public records. But some of these records date back for many years, and it may be necessary to check more than 50 public offices, in addition to that of the county recorder, to find them all. However, in theory, any land investor could make his own search of the records and form his own opinion. But your policy of title insurance goes far beyond a mere search of records and an opinion 
in two vitally important respects. In the first place, it ensures the accuracy of the opinion that title insurance and trust companies' experts arrive at after searching the records. In the second place, the policy of title insurance specifically protects you against a number of title defects that the most careful examination of public records would not reveal. So when you think of title insurance, which title insurance and trust company of Los Angeles provides, don't think of it as merely a search of public records and a written opinion. Remember that it is an actual insurance policy, a policy protecting you against loss due to many specified causes. And remember that some of the risks against which it specifically protects you are risks that the public records do not reveal. That is title insurance. <laughs> Lean John Brown, whom the Californians called Juan Flaco, took leave of Captain Gillespie and the 50 besieged Americans, left behind him the comparative safety of old Fort Hill in Los Angeles, and slowly threaded his way toward the Californians' lines at the foot of the slope. Carefully, his horse picked its way down the ravine, closer, closer to the guns of the enraged citizens of the Pueblo. Suddenly... Alto! Who goes there? Friend, amigo! So, in advance and show yourself. Hola, Pedro, who is it? I cannot tell you, senor. He says amigo with an Americano accent. Hola, come forward, senor. But watch your step, or we have you covered by 15 rifles. Very well. Here I am. Caramba, an Americano soldier. No, senor. You give yourself up? See, si. I'm deserting from that bunch up there. Be careful. Keep him under the point of your gun. This may be a trick. Si. Well, why should I want to trick you? I'm tired of those Americans up there. They haven't enough sense to see when they're licked. But I have. I've come to make peace. I'm not armed, as you can see. I want food. I'm hungry. <laughs> so will they all be before this is over. So you are deserted, eh, senor? Very well. Dismount and come forward. Stop, I said dismount. I heard you. Then do as I say. You are insolent, senor. If you expect clemency from me, obey what I say. Dismount. I will when I get good and ready. What? You stop him! Stop him! Stop him! He's not a deserter. He's a messenger. After him, quickly. Onto your horses and after him. He must be stopped. He got through the lines all right, but they're after him. Oh, if he only wasn't wounded. From the sound, I'd say there must be 15 horsemen chasing him. Yeah, they're going away fast. Almost out of hearing already. If you can pray now, soldier, pray that Lean John gets through. If he wasn't wounded or his horse hit, they'll never catch Lean John. He's on his way to Monterey. Come on, old fella. Faster. Faster. Got to get away from them. Is still running. Yeah, si, but slower. We'll catch him before he gets to the canyon. Come on, faster! Come on, old fella. I know it's hard, but if you can just get me past the canyon. Come on, faster. They're gaining. On and on pounded Juan Flaco's gallant horse, even though it was already seriously wounded. After them roared 15 hard-riding Californians, gaining with every step. They were almost upon the lone rider, and suddenly, out of the night, loomed a 20-foot chasm, the canyon. Juan Flacco did not hesitate, and his gallant horse neither faltered nor paused. Whoa, whoa, caramba! Did you see that? He took the canyon and he jumped. Madre de Dios! Quick, down to the canyon after him. Quick, or he'll be away. He's away already, Capitan. By the time we cross down and around, he will be miles ahead. We've lost him. And fairly, too. What a horse! What a horse! Pulling away to safety was Lean John and his faithful animal. Only after the sound of his pursuers had died out completely did Juan Flacco allow the wounded horse to slow down. But the animal was running on his heart, and they'd only gone about two miles beyond the canyon jump when suddenly the horse could go on no longer. It fell to earth, dead. Leaving the dead horse, Juan Flacco, on foot now, made his way northward along the Santa Monica Mountains, hiding in the brush from the pursuing horsemen. Toward dawn, he approached a lonely ranch house nestled at the foot of the hills, and there he approached the corral where the horses were kept. But as he reached it, a figure appeared. It was the ranchero aroused by the commotion of the horses. Oh, put up your hands. You're a dead hombre. 
Why, even in this light, I can see that's not a gun you're holding, only a stick of wood. You're, you're an American. Of course. But does that give you any right to steal my horses? An American. Oh, thank God. Explaining his mission, he obtained a fresh horse from the American, and once more he was off on his long journey. Over mountains, across open plain, through the brush and on the beach, he raced. There was no road. Half of the time, he could not even use the little trail that led north, for he had to detour around every ranch, every village, and avoid any horseman he might see. For this was hostile enemy country. He would probably be shot on sight. On and on he pressed, borrowing a fresh horse whenever his steed was worn out. He'd been on the trail for 27 hours when he pulled into Santa Barbara. There, a small American garrison offered him food and rest. But he had no time. A fresh horse was all he wanted, and within an hour he was riding hard again. Once more he was sighted by a Californian patrol, and once more he rode his horse to death to outdistance them. Two days more he rode, and on the evening of the third day, his panting horse pulled up in front of the government house at Monterey. Oh! Who are you? John Brown, Captain Gillespie's company, reporting. I have a message from Captain Gillespie. Good heavens, man. You look as though you'd ridden all the way without a stop. I have. Gillespie's in trouble. Under siege. Must have help immediately. I must deliver my message to Commodore Stockton at once. Good Lord, man. Commodore Stockton isn't here. He's on up north at San Francisco. Three days and three nights of continuous riding. Now, his destination reached. Juan Flacco found that he must go another hundred or more miles to get help for his friends. For three hours, he slept the sleep of exhaustion. Then, climbed astride a racehorse furnished him by Captain Maddox and started again. On and on, doggedly, determinedly. Although he was aching in every muscle, his eyes were sunken and blurred, his head spinning from lack of sleep. On and on, all day, until that night, after four days of the roughest ride in history, he pulled up on the beach at San Francisco, having ridden almost 600 miles from Los Angeles. There, he met Commodore Stockton. John Brown, you've done a great thing. With your help, we'll get Captain Mervine and his men to Los Angeles in time to save Gillespie. But now, man, you'd better get some sleep. Commodore, uh, just show me a bed. Commodore Stockton ordered the frigate Savannah to set sail for Los Angeles at once. But out in the bay, she ran into heavy fog and was delayed for days. Even so, the relief would not have arrived at Los Angeles in time. That is the ironic twist to Juan Flacco's great ride. It was in vain. Perhaps that is one reason why it has not been celebrated in song and story, along with the easier exploits of Paul Revere or General Sherman. Two days after Lean John Brown arrived in San Francisco, Captain Gillespie met with Juan Flores, commander of the Californians. So, you come, Capitan Gillespie. You are ready with your answer to my ultimatum? First, let me be sure of your terms, General Flores. Of course. I promise your men no harm if you will evacuate the city at once. March to San Pedro, board the ship Vandalia at anchor there, and sail away for good. It is very reasonable, I think. I do not ask for your arms or even for surrender. Just go away and leave us alone. And if I refuse? Refuse? How can you, Senor Capitan? You know as well as I do that your supplies will not last much longer. They will be gone before any reinforcements could reach you. But if I do refuse? Then I promise you annihilation. My men will not be held in bounds much longer. We'd make a very good fight of it, General. Perhaps. Until your supplies were gone, your ammunition exhausted, what then? All right. We'll march to San Pedro. With heavy heart, Gillespie's men marched to San Pedro and boarded the waiting merchant vessel... But they did not sail. Instead, they waited until, a few days later, Captain Mervine and the Savannah anchored nearby. Then, with their combined forces, Mervine and Gillespie tried to retake Los Angeles. But the Californians were ready for them. And on the Dominguez Ranch near the harbor, they started a long-range battle. Uh, that pesky cannon. Can't we do something to get rid of it? Oh, what, Captain Mervine? We've tried charging it time after time. They just lasso it and drag it away to a new position. But if we could only get past it, we'd lick them in no time. That gun's our only weapon. Well, it's enough. They can keep us out of firing range with it. And it's doing a lot of damage, sir. Our casualty list is already high. What do we do? Do? I guess there's only one thing to do, Gillespie. Retreat. Retreat to the ship and sail. 
It'll take the whole army and navy to capture Los Angeles this time. So the Americans turned back, carrying their dead and wounded with them. If only they could have known that on the Californian side, great sighs of relief went up. Ah, there they go. Turning around to go back. See, the Americanos are retreating. The Pueblo is saved. See, but, senores, get down on your knees and thank the saints that preserved us. Why, what do you mean, General Flores? Look, do you see that little cannonball there? See, si, see, si, of course. It is for the old woman's gun. See, si, for the brass cannon which forced the Americanos to retreat. See, si, well, what about it? That, senores, is the last cannonball. If they had charged again and we had fired it, there would have been nothing more to stop the Americanos from taking Los Angeles. So thank the saints, mi amigos. Madre de Dios. And so Juan Flaco's ride came to naught. It remained for the forces of Stockton and Vermont to retake Los Angeles and California in a full dress war. But that unhappy ending can never take away the homage due to Lean John Brown, Juan Flaco, one of the most daring, most dangerous, most grueling rides ever made for the cause of a nation. America owes gratitude to another unsung hero, Juan Flaco. His story furnished a chapter of history rich in the romance of the ranchos. Romance of the Ranchos is a service offered to the people of this community by the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles. Service to the community, of which it is a part, has been the watchword of this institution since its founding. And the Title Insurance and Trust Company is continually searching for new ways to serve. Most important of all is this company's ability to provide the most complete, accurate, and prompt title insurance service available. This outstanding ability is your positive protection against loss when you deal in real property. And it is available at the Title Insurance and Trust Company at rates which are substantially lower than the average cost of such service elsewhere. And now, Frank, what's the story for next week? Next week, we'll reveal the romantic life story of the founder of the city of Wilmington, Phineas Banning. But remember, the next romance of the ranchos comes to you at a new time, 8.30 on Sunday evening. Jot that down. 8.30, Sunday evening, March 8th. The Romance of the Ranchos. So until a week from Sunday, this is your wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, saying, Hasta la vista, señoras y señores. The Romance of the Ranchos, a presentation of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles, featuring Frank Graham as the wandering vaquero, is dramatized by John Dunkel and produced by Ted Bliss with special music arranged by Irwin Yo. Bob Lamond speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Okay.